Hi, and welcome to The Virtues of War, Politics, Policy, and Perception of Military Service. I'm your instructor, Logan Isaac. I'm a 100% disabled Iraq veteran and founder of CenturionsGuild.org, a nonprofit that educates ministers who care for Christian soldiers. I'm an educator, and I'm often called on to teach in formal settings. In 2013, I got my start in the philosophy and religion department at Methodist University, Go Lions, where I taught several core courses in Fayetteville, North Carolina, as well as a few on post at Fort Bragg, where I got my own start in higher education with night classes at the Education Center in 2002. In fact, after a deployment in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2004, I was honorably discharged as a non-commissioned officer in 2006. Then from 2008 to 2010, I completed a bachelor's degree in human services from Hawaii Pacific University. Go, uh, I think we're sharks now, but we may have used to have been the warriors. I can't remember. In the fall of 2010, I enrolled in the Master of Theological Studies program at Duke University, Go Blue Devils, where I also earned a certificate in gender, theology, and ministry. After my MTS, I went to Scotland for a Master of Letters in Systematic and Historical Theology from the University of St. Andrews. I, I have no idea what our mascot is. Maybe it's a lion or a unicorn, I'm not sure. But anyway, go University of St. Andrews. After my MLET, I returned to teaching, taking a position as a teaching assistant back, back at Duke Divinity for uh, the 2016 calendar year. I've given this course for credit in, in spring 2017 through the political science department at Duke, where I'm serving as an adjunct professor. However, there are a number of friends and fellow veterans following along on my website. This video is intended as a study guide for my enrolled students, but I hope it will also serve as a means of drawing in community engagement and participation as well. Let's get started. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to hit pause and think about your story. I want you to think about what makes you who you are, and for that matter, what are you? For example, not everybody knows that I used to be a competitive skateboarder. I started when I was in high school as a means of transportation, and then when I got stationed at Fort Bragg, it was just something to do in the evenings and weekends. And by the time I got to Hawaii, I got good enough to where I placed in a couple of co local competitions. So skateboarder is something that I am. What are some ways you would use to describe yourself? What kind of character are you? Or what different characters do you embody sometimes? Write down your reflections, either in complete sentences or just use keywords. After you're done, hit play again and we'll continue. I'll count down from three so you can hit pause. Ready? Three, two, one. Okay, now that you've hit play again, let's continue. You can read the rest of this homily on the, on the introduction blog entry on my website. If you're already there, you can scroll down and read along or just watch as I go through the slides. I'll try to make them as exciting as I can, which probably isn't saying very much. Before I get too far, I want to acknowledge that I aspire to be a Christian. It is my understanding, after three years of formal theological training, that one cannot legitimately self-proclaim that title because Christians will be known by their love. It's a passive relationship. You get to tell me if I'm a Christian. Insofar as I fail to love, I forfeit my membership in the church, but I do aspire to be a Christian. My aspiring does not furthermore obligate me to persuade or compel anyone to the same. I self-identify as a theological educator, and I take this as a pedagogical imperative. My loving you as I am called to as a Christian means that I trust that you are capable of arriving at your own legitimate, thoughtful conclusions, even if they're not my own. I come from a family of educators, in fact. Both my parents have been teachers most of my life, my dad for my entire life, and my mom for most of, most of my life. Their example inspired me, and I have a very, very high view of education. I'm the first in my family to complete more than one graduate degree and the first to teach above a high school level. Educate, the word, derives from the Latin educere, or educere, a complex word combining ex, which means out of, with duce, to lead. It's also the, the root for the word duke. If education involves being led out of yourself, then it names an origin, but it does not name a destination and therefore gives no direction. Theology does name a destination, God, and therefore also a direction and a journey, which has been called faith. I don't mention this to condemn non-theological education, but just to register that you are ultimately in control of where your education leads you, and I think that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. My favorite line in Christian scripture is from our Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, 
where the creator of the universe invites a human being to debate. Let's reason together, God says to the prophet Isaiah in the first chapter of the book that bears his name. Theological also names my story, as I have a degree in theological studies from Duke University, where I first taught this course. It was at Duke, in fact, that I came to disagree with many of my own instructors, none of whom spoke from personal experience about what it meant to be a soldier. Consensus within theological disciplines, or at least the consensus I've encountered, is that soldiers are fundamentally morally compromised, and many theologians are willing to say, and have said, that the military is inherently evil. That may disclose to careful observers why I'm not teaching in that nearby school. My own six years of experience proved contrary to what I was taught by most of my professors. Having a, we'll say, disappointing seminary experience is nothing new, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer felt let down by progressive German professors under whom he studied when they supported Hitler, especially Adolf von Harnack, an eminent church historian. And this is him. Ironically, I found something of value in Harnack that his own student did not, as Harnack was, was the first modern academic to tackle the scholarly question of military service in the centuries before Christianity was made legal in ancient Rome. Militia Christi, Latin for Army of Christ, uh, Harnack's book, was the first to apply historical critical analysis to the question of killing and service. I believe, with what is a minority within the Christian community, and maybe the liberal academic community as well, that there are inalienable virtues which find their highest expression, at least symbolically, in military service. Even as a pacifist, I am committed to investigating with intellectual rigor and theological and political nonpartisanship the paradox that no religion or moral philosophy can do without the images which are taken from war, and on this account, it cannot dispense with soldiers. I discovered my story when I began to write a memoir at just 30 years of age. I discovered quickly that my story and the stories of many soldiers and veterans often proves to be an inconvenient obstacle to the stories that others seem to tell about soldiers and veterans. The dissonance between the story of military service as I understood it with direct experience and the story with which the American public was familiar through degrees of separation is actually a primary focus of this course. This course itself has a story as well, which we may get to in time. But for now, let us consider why stories are important in the first place, even in the straight, white, phallic, and vaguely Christian ivory tower we call academia. Alastair MacIntyre, a Scottish philosopher educated at Oxford, made waves in philosophical circles when his book After Virtue was first published in 1981, and you'll be, I hope you will read the chapters that are provided to you. In the first half of his book, it focuses too much for the purposes of this course on his criticisms of the liberal enlightenment project. One of his favorite words is interminable, which he uses to describe the differences between rival ethical traditions, between we might, what we too easily will call progressivism and conservatism. The total inability of two competing political tra traditions to even agree on terms and definitions is seen everywhere from conversations between friends on Facebook to the halls of Congress and the office of the president. This is McIntyre here, looking very studious. He insists that a central defining feature of modern moral assertions and discourse is that the use, which is the purpose or function of moral language, has obscured its actual meaning, which is embedded in history. The name that McIntyre gives this problem is emotivism, a state in which all moral judgments are nothing but expressions of preference, expressions of attitude or feeling. Emotivism has created a world in which politics has become utterly meaningless because, quote, in moral argument, the apparent assertion of principles functions as a mask for expressions of personal preference, end quote. In other words, subjective use too often obscures objective meaning. As a philosophy, emotivism claims to be an account of all moral judgments, which themselves are ultimately subjective and preferential. Emotivism is ultimately an autonomous, individuated moral structure, a kind of non-philosophy which dooms Western culture because it can never be socially embodied. As we began this course, I've asked us all to consider who and what we are. By doing so, we get an idea of what our story is as a social group. Our sum story is made up of individual parts, and we can only know the whole by attending to our particulars. Therefore, I want you to think about yourself in terms of your own story both the story you tell yourself 
and the story that others tell about you. The stories that we inherit tell us who we are, where we came from, and what kind of world we live in. Stories that others tell about us can even shape our own self-perception and influence what we think about ourselves, as well as who and what we believe we can become. But what makes the stories told about you true or false, good or bad? More importantly, what if elements of your story are true but bad, or for that matter, good but false? We may not prefer the former that we may not prefer the former be said about us, and in the interest of moral self-preservation, perhaps we fabricate the latter. After all, who doesn't want to be seen as a good person? It's all those other assholes that are the problem, am I right? At the end of the day, McIntyre, McIntyre may suggest that this is the only social embodiment emotivism can manage to muster, a fragile and volatile mix of personally determined legal entities unable to negotiate conflicting interests because all they can imagine are their own. Any moral debates become interminable because values are finally subjective. Morals would be relative to the individual and their own preference. McIntyre highlights classical Western cultures as those who possessed a morally consistent philosophy, cultures in which, quote, the chief means of moral education was the telling of stories, end quote. Understanding characters within these social dramas provided a means of interpreting the behavior of the actors. Characters are centrally important because they are the moral representatives of their culture, because of the way in which moral and metaphysical ideas and theories assume through them, characters, an embedded, embe embodied existence in the social world. End quote. Emotivism fails because it cannot be socially embodied. There are no centrally defining features by which actual human beings are able to associate consistently in a world where all moral judgments become nothing but expressions of preference. The virtues necessary for people to thrive as a political body are transmitted in narratives, which provide historical memory, adequate or inadequate, of the societies in which they were finally written down. More than that, they provided a moral background to contemporary debate in classical societies, an account of a now transcended or partly transcended moral order whose beliefs and concepts were still partially influential. You might wonder why I've titled these short lectures homilies. I'm aware that some of you may hear that word and think of particularly religious themes, but it is simply a Greek word, homilane, the singular form of which is the feminine noun homilia, meaning conversations or intercourse, but not that kind of intercourse. Homilane was adopted by Christians in the third century to mean short sermons, but its historical meaning actually predates its Christian usage. Even though its modern use is so overwhelmingly religious, the church only adopted the word, we did not birth it. Therefore, we cannot say that the word homily ought or should carry a distinctly religious meaning. Meaning is historically situated and can be traced, whereas use fluctuates over time and across space. The science of tracing the history of words is called etymology, from the Greek word etymos, for true or actual, and I'll use etymology often throughout the course. However, a word's etymology is not the same as a defini dictionary definition, and I also cannot promise that etymology is as intriguing as Benedict Cumberbatch. Academics are beginning to acknowledge that history is not value neutral, that it comes to us through fellow subjective, fallible human means. Recognition that history is political, that its transmission is subjective, has led many authors and academics to substitute a definite article, the history of, with an indefinite article, a history of. After all, if it is written by the victor, then history is not value neutral. The political nature of history influences the divorce of the meaning of words, which is to say origins and history, from their typical modern use. Since stories are made up of words and are similarly transmitted via corruptible means like ink and paper or human language, their cultural use often stands in contrast to their origins in fact. For this course, I ask that you pay close attention to the history of soldier stories, their words, and the people that they describe. I will call attention to who does the narrating of these stories and ask you to consider the credibil their credibility as narrators, whoever they may be. In doing so, I hope you will learn to question which history, history you receive 
and whose meaning you assume when these stories, words, and people are shared. Some narrators will be shown to be more reliable than others. After all, one universally accepted criteria for credibility is direct experience. In this course, we'll look at who it is that the American public seems to trust and or desire to tell soldier stories. Together, we will explore why that is and what it reflects about public expectations and narrative corruption of martial identity. This course is, after all, about stories and their effect on people. We are going to be comparing actual stories as they originate from primary source material, in this case military personnel, against the meaning that those stories are given in transmission to and within a public, often by non-military narrators. Any difference between contextual meaning and social use will help us determine how soldier stories are being used, and how that departs from their basis in fact. It stands to reason that the further from fact social stories are from their embodiment, the more questionable or suspect their transmitted meaning. All right, that does it for this first installment of The Virtues of War. Remember to follow along every week on Twitter and Facebook with the hashtag Virtues of War. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to hearing your feedback in the comment section below. See you next time.